Hello and welcome back to IT at the Forge. Now that we're in semester two, we'll be heading into new territory this week as we talk about networks. Now, as we've seen, it's pretty impressive what a single computer is capable of. However, things get really interesting when you start allowing computers to talk and work with each other. The term network is loosely defined as connections between individual components. And most humans have a network of friends, family, or acquaintances, connections that they've made throughout their lifetime that define relationships. Computers are able to form connections as well. A computer network is formed when two or more computers are connected, allowing the transfer of data between them. Two computers can share data just like two people can share a dialogue. A computer network can be made up of two computers or hundreds of thousands. There's no maximum size. These connections can be made via special network cables or with wireless technology, which we'll talk about in another lesson. Probably the most obvious benefit of computer networks is the internet. Accessing web pages, email, and social tools has transformed our means of communication as a species. Sharing information such as data files and software programs saves time and allows people to work together more easily. Networks also allow the sharing of peripheral resources such as printers, which saves money on buying expensive equipment. There are many benefits to using the combined power of networked computers and still many more that we're discovering even today. Now, a network has several physical components that together make it possible to send signals, provide a medium across which signals are transmitted, and make it possible to receive signals on the other end. A network interface card, or a NIC, makes it possible for a computer to send data and to receive data from another computer. NICs have a port that extends outside of the system unit called an RJ45 connector, more commonly referred to as an Ethernet port. And what do you plug into an RJ45 connector? A cable! Cable wiring is the means by which computers in a network usually send and receive data. Different kinds of cable have varying speeds and limitations in sending signals clearly. The most common cable used in small networks today is Ethernet twisted pair cabling. Different types of twisted pair cables are categorized according to the performance and testing standards. For example, CAT5E is the most common type of network cable in use today. It can carry signals at 1000 megabits per second. Now something to know about cables, the longer the cable, the more signal drop off there is. CAT5E can carry a signal at that rate for about 100 meters. CAT6 can carry a signal at 10 gigabits per second. That's 10,000 megabits for about 50 meters, after which it drops off to 1,000 megabits a second. CAT7 cable is capable of 100 gigabits a second at very short distances of up to 15 meters and drops off to 10 gigabits per second after that. Now, common for larger networks today is fiber optic cable, which uses light guided through thin glass tubes to send data. This is a popular choice in many cities for connecting households to internet service providers. When data travels on a network, it does so in what is called packets. We'll talk more about the specifics of packets later, but for now you can think of them simply as an envelope with a destination address and a return address written on the front. There are some important pieces of hardware that help manage these packets as they travel over network cable. A hub is a central point where all of the computers on a network connect. All data is sent first to the hub, which then forwards that data to every other computer on the network, regardless of its address. This creates a lot of unnecessary traffic on the network. And due to this, simple hubs are not really a technology that's used anymore. An improvement upon the hub is what is called a switch. A switch is a type of hub that uses a table to keep track of destinations so the messages can be sent directly to its destination computer and not needlessly to every other computer on the network. Now while switches manage communication between devices on a network, another piece of hardware called a router manages communication between networks. A router connects devices on a small office and home network to the internet, which is a different classification of network. We'll talk more about that here in just a minute. Another way computers and devices may be networked together is with wireless technology, affectionately known as Wi-Fi. As its name implies, Wi-Fi doesn't use cables, but rather sends data using radio frequencies. This technology is limited to short distance and requires what is called a wireless access point to connect to and join the network. Now you may have something like this sitting in your home. It's important to realize that this device is a switch, a router, 
and a wireless access point, all in the same unit. These are appropriate for small office and home networks, also called SOHO networks, as they combine three devices into one for convenience. And the last three things we'll go over today are network types, topologies, and architecture. Now, when we talk about types of networks, we're generally talking about the size or area serviced by a network. SOHO networks, or small office and home networks, are what we call LAN, or local area networks. These are used to connect computers and devices that are relatively close together. A step up from LAN is WAN, a wide area network. These are needed when computers on different LANs or in different geographic locations want to communicate. WANs connect smaller networks together. The largest WAN in the world is what we affectionately call the Internet. However, there are many other WANs that are smaller and more specialized. Topology refers to the layout of devices that are connected on a network. Much like the arrangement of furniture in a room, the way in which computers are connected can affect the functionality of the network. Because WANs cover such a large geographic area and usually consist of many smaller networks, it's difficult to define what the topology of a WAN is. However, there are several common topologies for LAN, and they all have the same goal, to enable users to share resources and data. The first we'll look at is bus topology. In this setup, every computer is connected to a central cable that has a terminator at each end. Now it's really easy to connect computers to a linear bus, and it requires less cable than other topologies. However, if the central cable breaks, it divides the network into two separate sections. This means that computers on one side won't be able to communicate with computers on the other. Also, if the entire network shuts down, it's difficult to locate the problem. This topology isn't used very often except on large-scale networks. The internet, for example, employs this topology, connecting major service providers together. The central cable is called the backbone of the internet. Next is the ring topology. Here, each node, or computer, connects to exactly two other nodes. This forms a continuous single path for signals to travel through. The main benefit to this topology is that it is very organized. And because the data travels all in the same direction, it can travel at high speeds. A disadvantage of this type of network is that if one computer goes down, the entire network is impacted and cannot function. Enter star topology. This is the most common network topology today. One central node, or a hub or a switch, connects to each computer or network device individually. All data first goes to the central node and then is sent out to its destination. A benefit here is that if there is ever a problem with a connected computer or device, the network of other devices can continue working without being affected. However, a central node means a single point of failure. If that switch goes down, so does the whole network. A modern solution to this is found in what is called mesh topology. Here, each device in the network can act as a router. In a fully connected mesh network, every device is connected to every other device. A network in which some devices are connected only indirectly to others is called a partial mesh network. Now, sitting just above its bus topology foundation, the internet is a fine example of partial mesh routing, which we'll look closer at in another lesson. The advantage of using a mesh network is that it provides redundancy, which makes it more reliable. However, it's very expensive. Last but not least is architecture. Architecture more closely defines the relationship between computers on a network rather than how they're organized, which is what topology is. In a client-server architecture, one computer, called a server, controls the access that other computers have to shared resources like storage space, documents, email, and printers. These computers are the clients. The client machines, those that talk to the server and receive data from it, usually do not communicate with each other directly. A peer-to-peer -peer architecture, or P2P, is more democratic than a client-server setup. Here, each computer is equal to every other computer on the network, and all may send and receive data without going through another machine first. When a P2P network is in place, any user on the network can access explicitly shared files and folders stored on the other machines in the network. Now, this works really well, and it's convenient when those on the network have a high level of trust in one another but it can be a security risk too. And that wraps it up for our first high-level look at networks. Over the next several weeks, we'll dive a little deeper into some of the topics we covered today. And although it may seem a little complicated at times, it also becomes vastly more fascinating. 
Thanks for joining me today, and we'll see you next time in the Forge.